Gregory Jordan, SJ, born in New Zealand. He's stationed in Brisbane, where his chaplain is in Gregory's traditional Latin Mass community, the Medical Guild of St. Luke, the Apostles of Mary, and the St. Vincent de Paul Social Justice Committee. He's also the Archdiocesan Exorcist. <laughs> On the national level, he's chaplain of the Australian Catholic Students Association, as well as Director of Courage and Courage. He was formerly Headmaster of Jesuit Schools in Sydney, the Rector of University Colleges in Hobart and Brisbane, and he's a wonderful man with a marvellous message, and he's still <laughs> as busy as he ever was at 82 years of age. Fantastic man, Father Gregory Jordan. Lex Randy, Lex Credendi. I'm amazed somebody came with just a Latin title like that put up there. <clears throat> You're pretty game. Uh, we call it Lex Orandi as the short title given to uh, this famous axiom derived from Pope Celestine I who governed 422 to 32 and who wrote Legem Credendi Statuit Lex Orandi literally the law that governs our praying that is the liturgy is also the law that governs our believing that is what we believe it's saying that the church's liturgy is the most effective means of preserving the true faith and of interpreting it. So, there are in this axiom, uh, this aphorism or tag, uh, as it has become, two elements, prayer and belief. And... Pope Celestine is saying that there's a relationship between the two. <laughs> but before we go on, there was another man, uh, Prosper of Aquitaine, well known, uh, in uh, the same century. And he uh, put it this way, in my translation. Let's look at the prayer and the sacraments of priests. They are handed down by the apostles and they are now celebrated in the entire world and in every Catholic church uniformly. So that the law of praying tells you the law of believing. You can find out what the church believes by looking at the way in which it worships. That's very, very useful. There are two forms of that. Well, let's go back a stage further. Uh, in the rite of in the rite of reception into full communion with the Catholic Church, a baptized Christian, Protestant or Orthodox, the candidate uh, has to make this declaration: I believe and profess all that the Holy Catholic Church believes, teaches and proclaims to be revealed by God. Marvellous, sacred moment. Crossing that threshold into the church. The change in life. Some of you have done that, I know. And the priest says in return, Alphonsus, or whatever it is, the Lord receives you into the Catholic Church. His loving kindness has led you thus far. So that in the unity of the Holy Spirit, unity, you may have full communion with us in the faith that you have professed in the presence of this family. Note the unity and the communion in question is unity in the faith. The Latin word fides and fideo, I trust, it's linked with the word trust and uh, belief is intimately bound up with the act of trusting you, you trust another who informs you, it's not because you have witnessed something because you believe the witness that you accept that as a truth and uh, our theological virtue of faith is closely allied with that of hope uh, our word confident see? Fides is in, in that middle of that Latin word. It's included faith in it. 
And the, the Greek word is pretty well the same, this duo uh, in the Greek, it means believe, but really it's trust. So faith in uh, the one, one word covers all that extended and marvelous proclamation of faith made by the candidate, I believe, profess and so on. The next question is, what did God reveal and where do we find it? First, the what. It's all the truths necessary for our salvation. That and nothing else. He didn't reveal, for instance, that the earth is round. And it's not necessary for salvation to believe that. Just as well there would have been very few in from the first millennium, otherwise. <laughs> and a half. It's, um, when you get to heaven you're going to meet a whole lot of flat earthers, you know. <laughs> You're going to have some interesting discussions. <laughs> you know, when did you learn, you know, that the earth was round? But uh, don't be too cocky because, you know, our posterity may well discover whole lots of things that we don't believe in now or don't know. And um, they'll think us pretty dumb that we didn't know it. So, uh, you know, then God chooses the weak to confound the strong and the foolish to confound the wise, says Paul. So the what the church believes in begins in God, in the Trinity, looking down on the human race, so sinful, so ignorant of God. And they decide that God's eternal Son would go down on earth and actually become a man like us, in all things, sin alone accepted, as we learn, we read, to reveal to us those truths necessary for salvation. For the generations that will follow Christ's return to the Father, he establishes his church, which will never die. The gates of hell, that means the forces of death, the gates of hell will never prevail against it, he says to Peter, now called a rock, instead of Kephas. So uh, he's revealed uh, those truths, and he's sealed them with the Spirit, in the church and he's given the church the authority and the command through the apostles at the very end to teach all nations all I have commanded you that is the what that the church believes not all those other things like the round nature of the earth or uh, you know nuclear uh, theories and things of that relativity question number two where do we find it well first in the Bible of course Second, in the creeds, which were the creedal formulae, whether the Nicene or the uh, Apostles, uh, were the, the symbol of faith uh, used uh, at b baptism of pagans. So uh, they were used either for those baptisms or as a rebuttal of the heresies occurring in the church, hence the word consubstantial. Don't let me hear anybody complaining about consubstantial. That's made its uh, appearance again in the language of the liturgy. But the third is precisely the third source where we find that what of all those truths. We find it in the liturgy. Pope Celestine is saying, if you want to find out what the church believes and teaches and proclaims, go to the text of the liturgy and study that. But not only just to read it, not just a reading of the text in your study, but also to live a celebration of the liturgy. And you will discover in that living of it, that active participation, what the church believes and teaches was revealed by God. Go to the Roman canon, the first Eucharistic prayer, the text used every day by every priest in Europe practically in the Mass for 1400 years or more. I don't know if anywhere else in human history that sort of thing has occurred. What a phenomenon. And when the Lutzer, you know what, and of course it becomes a foundation stone of the Western civilization. And when the Liturgical Reform Commission 
submitted its draft text to Pope Paul VI in 69 or so for his approval, he found that that Roman canon had been suppressed. It was just cut out. And it was replaced with the other canons that we also have, two, three, and four, and various other ones, children's and reconciliation ones, in the Novus Order. He told the chairman, uh, Archbishop Anibale Budnini, put it back. He did. So, an exercise of the chair of Peter's authority, eh? Saving us from something not very pleasant at all. And it's still here today in the Novus Ordo as the Eucharistic prayer number one, the Roman canon. Here more than anywhere was an example of that other great saying from the patristic era, quadubique et ab omnibus, creditor and so on. What is believed and taught everywhere and by everyone is the Catholic faith. And that was the Roman canon. And it was the authority of the Holy Father, the See of Peter, that restored it. So what Celestine is saying is, if you want to find out what the church teaches and believes, don't go to Google. <laughs> go to Mass. <laughs> Attend Mass. Participate in Mass as far as you possibly can. Uh, the text will tell you what the church believes, but also the entire liturgy enacted by priests, ministers and people who kneel, rise, bow, genuflect, sing, pray in silence, pray in unison with one voice, go to receive our Lord and Holy Communion devoutly and devoutly does reflection afterwards. This tells an honest inquirer what we believe. Somebody has told me of how after years as a Baptist, baptized child who would never been in but knowing was something missing, he met someone who went to Mass, and the, a, a stranger, and the next weekend, all weekend, he knew he had to go to attend Mass and he walked in and he knew immediately this was it. It told him. So, what have we got next? So far, so good. But the reliability of the liturgy as a place to find Catholic truth and belief, to acquire the concept and the knowledge of it, is dependent on it being itself shaped and formed by those truths revealed by Christ. Catholic belief. Therefore, we should discern in this principle, uh, lex orandi, lex credendi, an even more fundamental law, namely that Catholic truth determines the nature of our liturgy. It determines its limits. It corrects, if necessary, any errors. Yes, that can happen. Any inaccuracies that creep into the liturgy it makes good any omissions and the result should be a liturgy in which the Catholic feels at home, can have total confidence in, he continues to learn from year to year with the repetition of this liturgical cycles. Each year I learn a bit more from life and I go back and it, I see in the same readings new things I did not realize ever before and ever, ever in my previous readings. Maybe with the help of a prayerful uh, leader of the presider of the over the liturgy and priest and so I keep learning and growing I expand spiritually with that repetition of those cycles uh, learning what our faith is what it means what it challenges us to do or stop doing see then how the meaning of this axiom is not a simple uh, one-dimensional thing. It's not one way only, but two-way. 
It's a, the, it's a relationship between Catholic liturgy and Catholic belief. Uh, the relationship is a dynamic one. It's a dialogue. It's an interplay there between the two. One shaping the other and the other expressing the first. And I'd go so far as to say that the common understanding of it uh, relies uh, the, uh, on that that uh, uh, that we rely on should take second place before the fundamental dynamics of liturgy it's the catholic faith that shaped it and drives it still well then we move on let me begin now in going back to explain some of this uh, where Cardinal Ratzinger began when he wrote his wonderful book The Spirit of the Liturgy Father Joe Fessio claims it's the only book he ever wrote well that was at that stage he hadn't written his scriptural ones but the others are mostly um, pieces, essays or they are interviews by uh, some noted uh, journalist and he had a great impact on them. Thank you. And uh, th th this is an absolutely superb book, by the way. It's, forget it, leave it. I, I, um, no. D thank you very much. Uh, do what you do what the, the nuns used to tell us with our pennies that we took for the plate. If it falls on the floor and a rose, leave it there. <laughs> if you pick it up, you only drop it again. <laughs> a wise woman, you know. So he begins in the Bible, of course, and he goes back to that moment in when liturgy truly began in the confrontation between Moses and Pharaoh oh yes you'd had sacrifices before but wait to see what happens originally God's command for Pharaoh was let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness in the desert it's repeated with slight variations at four times in all the discussions the robust interchanges between Pharaoh and Moses boosted by the plagues that went on after each session they had Aaron had to have uh, yeah so you have the exodus Pharaoh agreed to let them sacrifice to their God in the first instance but uh, in Egypt no said Moses we've got to go into the wilderness no out you go door closed first set of plagues back in again this time all right the men can go but no I want the women the children and the goats and the pigs oh, no no pigs are there sorry sorry uh, <laughs> I'm Irish <laughs> Irish as so uh, out the door more plagues uh, Becky comes and says Pharaoh um, yes <laughs> can I talk to you alright and he says this time uh, can we go and Pharaoh says very well but the, the men the women and the children can go but the cattle the herds have got to stay here no good out you go so finally more plagues and that finishes it off Pharaoh says you can go and out they go and of course the Egyptians are drowned in the Red Sea just in the nick of time and they can go into the desert where as to serve God worship him in a way that God is going to show them Moses won't let Pharaoh impose his restrictions on God's will for worship uh, and so Pharaoh's left with only one option the whole lot of them are left to, uh, are allowed to go we don't know what we will worship the Lord with until we get there, he says. 
So the flocks of herds have got to go too. The dominant concern in the liturgy here at his very beginning is not the promised land, they'd spent 40 years getting there, but the execution of the liturgy as God willed uh, them and God as God will show them without political intervention of any kind whatsoever. So the Israelites go in order to serve God in the wilderness. The promised land will be part and parcel of where and how God is to be worshipped, uh, the details of which are yet to be seen way in the future. Uh, hasn't been revealed yet. The promised land is not the ultimate purpose of the Exodus. We'll see how. Oh, the land is there from the very beginning in the promise to Abraham. Go to a land that I will show you. The word land is there. Soil, earth. And uh, it, it was, it, it's an issue worldwide, of course. And it was there at the very beginning. Is it not in that promise? And it's not go to a land uh, you can find for yourself. That would reduce them to any of the warring tribes looking for a place in the sun. And uh, that's not God's, uh, you know, with their periodic migrations. No, with Israel, the initiative was always with God. Right, oh, three months out of Egypt, they're at the, uh, they're camped before Sinai. God comes down on the mountain, Exodus 19, 16 and 20, and speaks to the people, revealing to them his will in two spheres that are fundamental. He gives them the Ten Commandments to govern their daily lives, and through Moses he makes a covenant with the people. That covenant is expressed in detailed form of worship, the very purpose of their exodus. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, it's spelt out a chapter after chapter after chapter in detail. And that's what they study and keep to in the worship of the temple once they get to build it or rebuild it, as we'll hear. And uh, so uh, that is the primordial meaning of lex orandi, lex credendi. God's will, it, which we believe and accept, and then express in our worship, in our liturgy. It's their acceptance of God's revelation through Moses. That is, their belief in what is God's will that determines the way they pray. That is, the way they worship God. Kill their sacrifices or offer the incense. They use the blood. And uh, they have expiated various uh, sacrifices of praise or worship, morning, evening, all of that. It governs the day, governs their whole life and sanctifies it as it is, of course, the case for us in the New Testament. <clears throat> so, at this early stage, they're not without, they're, sorry, they're not, they're not within an ass's bray of the promised land. That's 40 years in the future. But Sinai and its desert constitutes them God's people, both interiorly in their faith and exteriorly in their life, according to the uh, commandments and according to the, the covenants and all the directions of worship. Once they fall away from the covenant of Sinai, as will happen, even though they are established on the promised land, they'll lose it because they'll cease to be God's people. And they'll fall away to believe, as St. Paul says, in fables. Of he turned to fables, he warns Timothy, heaping to themselves teachers having itching ears. And the end result is they lose the land. And they lose, first of all, ten tribes. Where are they out of the twelve? Gone forever. Nobody knows. Uh, they, they thought they'd be in Ethiopia in the age of discovery. They think they're over in China certain Chinese they look at and they think they can <laughs> see certain distinctions. Very opposite, you think most of them have got rotten noses. So, whatever. But they, they go through this trying to find the ten tribes. They're all lost. They're leaving only Benjamin and Judah. So they are the remnant. 
And the remnant of those true tribes, a remnant of a remnant now, the ones who weren't slaughtered, murdered, they are taken into exile up in Babylon, and there they lament because we have no pre prince, no priest, no altar, no sacrifice. The Torah is lost to them. All the beauty of the temple, doing God's will. But, so they're compelled to live Sinai interiorly, as do Tobit and Sarah, when they marry. Beautiful. They remember what God's will is. And as does Susanna, she lives chastely, according to God's law. But not 40 years ahead, but 70, they return to that promised land providentially to find a copy of the Torah preserved, immured in the broken down wall of the temple. They summon all the people and they read it all the morning to the people. And the people were in tears. And they start again to rebuild, to rebuild Israel out of their belief. The tears of gratitude drive their energy to recreate the holy city where once again he'll be worshipped according to God's will. All that lies in Israel's future at this stage at Sinai but it's their belief always that drives them. Mean? What did Benedict say? The church of the future will be a considerably reduced church but it will be more fervent the apostasy back to Sinai and its desert Moses goes up the mountain to learn how the people are to serve God from God's own direction his own voice and uh, and we, we heard about that and what do the people do well, they yawn, they wait around, they scratch themselves, and they'll check their watch, and there's no sign of him coming around the mountain. <laughs> so what do they do? <laughs> they form a liturgy committee. Don't, don't you think that's a bit naughty? <laughs> and what do they decide to do? Let's have a golden calf. Come on, earrings, everybody, all your bangles and the rest. Uh, put them in the pot and boil it up and we've got a mould here. We're going to make a golden calf. As big as we can make it. And so they... Uh, they, they get to work around the craft and they have their liturgy. Note, um, what, what, hang on. Um, and they say, here, Israel, is the God of Israel who brought you up out of Egypt. They say that. You know, it's, 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 it's simply obscene that did the calf send the plagues? Did the calf confront Pharaoh? Did the calf drown the Egyptian army providentially? Of course not. And this is what they are saying. And uh, they, there is your God, Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Uh, in the face of this affront to Yahweh, what does Aaron do, the high priest? Well, he says, <clears throat> tomorrow we're going to have a feast in honor of Yahweh. It's not what he says, it's what he doesn't say. He doesn't step in and correct as Paul the sixth did, insisting that the first Eucharistic prayer be retained in the Novus Ordo, in the Reformed Liturgy. And from time to time, other publications have come out other statements from the Vatican to correct, to encourage, to enlighten. So, 
He doesn't say, Aaron, uh, this is an effigy of Yahweh, thank God. He doesn't go that far. The people are saying that. But it's what Aaron doesn't say that's important. Uh, and what he says is orthodox. Tomorrow we're going to have a feast in honor of Yahweh. That's okay. Uh, but he finishes up presiding over heteropraxis, not orthopraxis. That is, um, heterodox action, uh, uh, um, heresy, uh, inaction in a liturgy. So there's a hundred percent class between the two. The people aren't sure really what to do. They offered holocausts, they brought in communion sacrifices, that, that's a terrible expression. And then all the people sat down to eat and drink. And then afterwards, they got up to amuse themselves. Mm. Aaron says, the feast is in honor of Yahweh. The people say, the, of the calf, your God who brought you out of Egypt. Mixed messages. And it is at least the beginning of an apostasy. Yahweh sees it for what it is and tells Moses, your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, he's disclaiming any. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell them they're mine, sort of stuff. Um, they've apostatized. That they've been quick to leave the way marked out for them. There are several chapters of God's instructions uh, as to how they should worship in Deuteronomy that Moses has given them. They've made themselves a calf of molten metal and they've worshipped it and offered it sacrifice. Here is your God and so on. They've cried out. That is, they chant that. And uh, so God is singularly displeased. Moses is appalled. What they've done is revert to pagan practices. The psalm later on says, you know what happens. Later on the king's they, they run out of Jewish wives and they take pagan ones and concubines and uh, they have lots of worries being in charge of the country uh, that's always the case the deed polls are saying they're unpopular and so they uh, and the enemy is massing on the north front what are we going to do? come says one of the concubines or one of the pagan wives come up to the hilltop at midnight and we'll kill a chook and we'll put blood on your mind. all these silly things they do and you'll be right you'll see just if you do what we tell you to do and they're so worried and so anxious that they go along and follow it it's anxiety that drives people to go to tarot card people and fortune tellers and things of that silly things of that nature or let alone get out a widget board don't touch a thing of all they're all condemned of course in the Catholic Catechism well uh, God uh, Moses or rebukes them uh, they, I think the golden calf is destroyed and uh, there's a reconciliation the covenant is renewed and a pattern is set that's going to go on I forgot to say uh, talking of what happened in later generations the uh, um, the psalm says they even sacrificed their own children beat that they reverted to pagan sacrifice of their own children, not of just chooks and things, doves. Uh, of course, these days you can abort a child, but if you uh, maltreat the doves or your dogs, you'll be sued and can even be jailed as a result of the, uh, that organization, RSPCA. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that in the past 50 years we've seen an apostasy in the church, especially the Western church. The statistics for mass attendance in Australia have slumped from something approaching 70% down to 13%. Uh, in some cases, 10% of census Catholics, that is, Catholics who every five years tick the box saying Catholic, or Roman Catholic if you like. And uh, last year there was another mass count, but the results have not yet been published. I wonder where they're going to fit, where the needle's going to fall and stop on with this one. 
may well be below the 13 percent. Well, we live in hopes of uh, the graph doing a hockey stick and coming up again and a reconciliation occurring and a lot of things are necessary for that. How did this happen, this dramatic turnaround which dashed the hopes of the Vatican II era, focused especially on the vernacular uh, mass facing the people, priests facing the people. Well, nowadays because of the shortage of priests, very often it's the liturgy of the word facing the people. Not a mass. And uh, this mass, which was thought to be so people friendly and would hold them in and would attract more is the one precisely that has lost the people. It was not the traditional uh, extraordinary form uh, of the Roman rite which uh, lost them. Uh, that had already disappeared itself. It was um, off the bill effectively. Th though it is of course well and truly coming back. Now what, we, what do we derive from the events of the founding of Israel at Sinai that shed light on our worship in the 21st century? Above all, the truth appears that it must be our belief that governs our worship. On the other hand, if our worship is wonky, it will affect, it will rob our belief of its bite. And we will start to lose our grip and our vigor as believing Catholics. The original liturgical direction is the command of Jesus, do this in memory of me. To the first Christians, they obeyed it. Uh, they held the breaking of the bread in their own homes. The liturgy grew out of the Lord's sacred command. It also grew out of the Jewish liturgy of the word. And to a degree, the sacrifice in the temple, the liturgy of the word was in the synagogues. No sacrifices there. It was only up in the temple. And in his spirit of the liturgy, um, uh, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger brilliantly brings the two, shows how the, the two are brought together in the sacrifice of the Mass. And uh, uh, I've been told about the laws that govern our liturgy. Oh, they're man-made. You know, for instance, uh, if you object to intinction, of the, that is the communicant coming up with the host and dipping it in because they don't want to pick up somebody else's uh, infections uh, and they think this is the best way to avoid it. A, it's forbidden. B, in their fist goes. C, how far down do they put the host and does it go into the, uh, the precious blood? And none of us have got absolutely perfect nails. They could all, we, could all, we could all do with an examination of conscience and also of fingernails. <laughs> and under a microscope is not a pretty sight. So, uh, okay, uh, there is an example. They say made man. Yes, but what did our Lord say to the apostles? Whatever you um, bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven like uh, no longer being obliged to, hey that's time, uh, being obliged to um, fast, not so fast, but abstain on a Friday, things of that nature. Probably a bad move. Do you know that in England they're bringing it back in? The United Kingdom? Yeah. Um, so, uh, there's, there's much more, but it'd better come back next year or something like that. Uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll wind up there but it comes uh, down to the church's authority and you will find that beautifully described in this book by an Australian this is a key work on the liturgy it is the organic development of the liturgy by Alcuin Reed OSB he was a Melbourneite a convert to Catholicism, was ordained a deacon, but left, he went over to London and went and joined the Benedictine Abbey at Farnborough, St. Michael's. 
and continued his scholarly work there and brought that book out. I don't think he was ordained, but eventually he left there. His name, in fact, is Scott, and under that name he, there was an earlier one, A Bitter Trial, nice, nice slim volume, Evelyn War and John Carmel he, he, Cardinal Heenan on the Liturgical Changes. Brilliant. So, uh, that's read. At the end of the book, his conclusion is, it is the organic development, not sudden, jerky changes of direction in the liturgy that's to be approved, and always under the authority of the See of Peter, of the Bishop. And I think um, there are indications that we've come to the end of the penny section. And therefore it's going to be questions, is that right? Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Jordan. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, the usual dry whip that goes with it. And the Irish humour. Beautiful. Uh, we really appreciated that. The time for some questions. Yeah. Anne Marie will take this microphone around, direct questions to Father, who will repeat them for the camera. And keep them short, please. Thank you. Any questions? This lady here. Um, given the um, understanding that how you worship affects what you believe, then, then how on earth did the liturgists of the 1970s do this to, to devastate so much understanding and, and people's practice of the faith? I mean, I was an older girl, a liturgical dancer, everything in the 70s, and it, it really did destroy my faith, mm. and mm. most of my classmates do not practice their faith no, today. That's right, yes. Uh, the two go together. Um, given that uh, worship has such an impact upon belief, uh, why is it that these things came in to the liturgy uh, at that time, 1969-70? Uh, um, there are many in the liturgical movement, uh, the greats, who largely had died uh, off at that time, like but Louis Bouillet, for instance. He wrote with grave reservations about what was happening in the liturgical movement, even at that time. They are mentioned by uh, Alcuin Reed uh, in the, he, he lists them. It, it's, it's worth um, uh, getting that in detail. Uh, it's a mystery. Let me say one thing. Jump back to 1870-71, uh, if you can. Uh, the Vatican Council number one when the uh, doctrine of papal infallibility was uh, uh, defined as a dogma of the Catholic Church as you know uh, the, the robust discussions in the College of Cardinals in that conclave uh, or that council I should call it uh, it was led by two convert Englishman. On the one hand you had Cardinal Manning and he was all for it. He said it was this and whereas the other was Cardinal Newman who said it was he believed in papal infallibility but it was inopportune to do it. Not the right moment. Gives the wrong impression. Whereas Manning said no it is opportune. Do it now. And it went through. And Newman then found that his rather some some rather liberal friends he himself was not a liberal that must always be retained there are lots of lots of people who'd love to present him as a liberal just as some want to present mary mckillop as a, as a feminist it's 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 utterly untrue to them newman wrote to these people you'll read it in father edmund campion's book on newman telling them it may be that this formula is not, uh, he didn't say the bee's knees, but it's not, it's not the whole of the, uh, of the doctrine that you would like to see. See, don't forget that it was broken off mid-council uh, mid, uh, by the invasion by the Italian uh, Risorgimento, wanting to reunite, take over the Papal States and make Italy one nation. Italy wasn't a nation up to that stage. 
just a lot of people. And uh, so the, the, they ran for the lick of their lives because uh, they, were, they, they were getting attacked in the street. So uh, it broke up and wasn't really finished. And so he writes and says, if perchance there is something lacking or a, an emphasis that is not as balanced as it should be, then you may guarantee that the day will come when the Holy Spirit will ensure that some other council, some other pope, will restore that imbalance, will put back what was missing, what was left out at the time. And what happened in the Second Vatican Council, but the uh, collegiality of the bishops was also uh, um, uh, approved by the council, not exactly defined as a dogma, but there was a, a new force given to it. And I think we are seeing this now with uh, that, that book of the, the, the liturgy, it's the spirit of the liturgy, and uh, that was 99. Three years later, there was a conference at Fongombeau a, in France, the Benedictine <coughs> Abbey, a, a totally traditionalist one, which is flourishing, packed with young people, don't you know? And uh, all the experts came together to say, what are we going to do about the liturgy? And they spoke of the reform of the reform. And how you'd go about it, whether you could have it, and what do you do about the traditional rite, which had practically disappeared, except in uh, the uh, Society of St. Pius X, and, and a few others that plugged on regardless. This was now in 2002. And so... Uh, well, uh, and by that stage, all the priests in Pius X were suspended, sadly, and of course the bishops uh, excommunicated, though that has now been lifted. But the, the strategy is there, it's spelled out, and it's wonderful to see how that's going on. And oh, something else has fallen, eh? I'm getting unwired here. Golly, if ever I... Uh... <laughs> If ever I have a pacemaker or something like that, or something. <laughs> I better have a permanent electrician. <laughs> yeah. Now, it, does that help restore a bit of balance? It's it's happening before our eyes, and don't they hate it? Yeah. Right. <laughs> by the by the way, I have here. A document called Inform. Uh, that is a publication that comes from the Center for Adult Catholic Adult Education Center at Lidcom in Sydney, formerly run by Father John Flada, uh, a noted author and so on, and columnist in the Catholic Weekly regularly. And this particular one is on the new translation, the the, the what and the why, and it's by Father Don Richards. The uh, the liturgist for uh, Sydney. So he's at St Mary's Cathedral, or it was. And so you can, there's a copy right here uh, that people can take if they like. Okay? Another question? Any more questions? Father. Uh, Father at the back. This is Father Bernard McGrath of the Diocese of Sandhurst, which is Bendigo. It's not Sandhurst. Thank you, Father Greg. George was a Jesuit. <laughs> How'd you guess? <laughs> Father, I don't know if it's the right time to explain to us, please, the relations and connection between the official church liturgy, thanks be to God, and the so-called folk pieties, not to belittle them, but the proper relationship. Would you mind saying a bit about it? You, uh, I don't understand the folk pieties. And that's the other devotions we have to the various saint, well, the ladies' rosary. Oh, the, the, oh, yes, no trouble. Okay. What's the relationship between the uh, the sacrifice of the mass or, and and the divine office, which can, constitutes the liturgy, and uh, popular devotion, if you like, uh, such as the rosary, benediction, uh, stations of the cross, and so on, the the lack of which has been uh, is devastating. All right, 
We've got a thing, haven't we, in Australia called clear felling. Hyphen. Clear felling. And uh, these massive tractors go through with chomping and destroying and with a huge massive chain across that just pulls everything over. Except the, the massive giant, the forest giant. There's no way you can do it, so they just go around that one and keep going. And uh, it stays there. Now, what happens? It dies because there was an interdependence between it and all the scrub, scrubbery and shrubbery around it, the, the, the small creatures that, that sheltered there, and, uh, and so on. So, uh, the, and, and the bird life goes as well. But what's the story? To me, the forest giant standing there is the sacrifice of the mass. And we clear filled the devotions. Oh, partly it was practical. It was because benediction and benediction and rosary and, and, and a sermon on Sunday night will occur at 7:30 p.m. and uh, being a bit tautologous. And uh, and well, 20 percent of the parish would go. And especially on the first Sunday of the month when we had a a, a procession. And my, my hometown was famous for that. And, and, and the church utterly packed on Sunday night. So uh, that all went because you had evening mass. And uh, no one was going to have both an evening mass and the, those devotions. Uh, there was a practical, there was a mishmash. Also, which is mentioned by uh, Cardinal uh, Ratzinger himself, because he attended and presided over this conference at Fongombo. Uh, he said there were those who said the Blessed Sacrament is not something you look at it's something you consume something like that so it's for communion but after that over that was not what the last thousand years had told us oh yes there was there was not real reservation of the Blessed Eucharist for the first 900 years it was kept for viaticum but not as an object of adoration I don't know, there may be somebody who can instruct me, I don't think in the Orthodox churches or the Eastern churches that is the case either. But it certainly is uh, for us, friend, and it was for 900 years. And suddenly, overnight, it all goes. What happens? The forest giant, the mass, dies. And it died for the other, uh, what, 87%? who go on Christmas and Easter. C and D. Not C of E, but they may as well be. Yeah. That's, that's naughty, isn't it? You know. In Father, does that answer that question on the relationship? Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, this. Lady over here, where's Emery? Sorry, Emery. Yes. You're making Emery work. Put your running shoes on. Father has to go and say mass, of course. <laughs> Father, I would love for you to clarify something. I'm a special minister. Yes. And I'm not sure of how that fits in with the as we worship. Which I don't I don't um, I'm not, I don't consecrate the Eucharist I um, hand it out, I suppose or another. Well you distribute it. I distribute it. Yes. Hmm. And how does that in totally believed I don't have do I have the right to distribute the Eucharist? And the second part I have is it does worry me when I hear that I can invite anyone in that church or anyone in that church, believer or unbeliever, to receive the Eucharist. So you don't have to be oh, no. Oh, no. So I bet, I think that needs to be clarified in our church. Th that is quite wrong, yes. So two things. Uh, how do I fit in to the proper liturgy as a Eucharistic minister, a special minister? And secondly, um, what is to be said about that open invitation, all in together in this fine weather? Uh, we can't stand someone being excluded. This is an inclusive parish, and so on. <laughs> so everybody come and receive communion. Uh, all right. Uh, I've known of that to be done in the school by the chaplain, and that caused a great kerfuffle. Uh, so you got the two questions. To take the first one, uh, a special minister 
is a, a Eucharistic minister for a special purpose and uh, is, is not necessarily always to be called upon. For instance, when there is a concelebration, as there is often enough at a funeral or a mass or something like a, a perhaps a school mass, uh, the, it is the priests or any deacons who are there who should distribute communion. They are the ordinary ministers. You are a special minister and you are valued as such because the priest um, cannot be expected to give communion to the entire congregation when it is a big one, okay? And, it's, and in any case, if under both kinds, you do need someone else to offer the chalice, but no intention, right? Uh, by the way, intention is allowed if the priest does it. Yeah. That is allowed. That's what is done in the Orthodox and so on, mostly. So that's number one, okay, on that. Number two, uh, this open invitation is in, in the school where I uh, know that it occurred. Uh, the, the, uh, th there were children there who were Fijian Hindus, or Indians from Fiji. They're not baptized. And, and, and beautiful people, very strong family life and things of that nature, sometimes are better than some of our own. They wouldn't be too hard in some instances. <laughs> and they, they've got a very strong ethnic um, culture. But they're not baptized. It is ignorance profound, as is said by Monsignor O'Brien in Tang Malang Malu, yeah. <laughs> an ignorance profound <laughs> on the bishop's visit there to confirm. And uh, the gangly youths were asked, pray, what is Christmas Day? Why do we do it and <laughs> celebrate it? And a squall of knowledge hit the boy from Tang Malang Malu, and he knocked the desk over to, to give the answer. It's the day, he, he said, what no bishop ever knew. It's the day before the races, the Tang Malang Maluk. <laughs> if, if Monsignor Hartigan were back now, he, I don't think he could write that. He'd weep. Very good note to close on, I think, Father. Okay. Right. Um, we've run out of time. Another big round of applause. Please.